<laughs> Representative Presley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, to my dear and fierce colleague from New Mexico for convening us this evening. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today on behalf of the communities in my district and across our nation who for too long have been asked to wait. For those who have had their justice delayed time and again by inaction, obstruction, or the status quo. I rise today because I support the worker and their family, caregivers and child care workers, parents and essential frontline workers, our disabled siblings, our environmental injustice communities, and our immigrant neighbors. For months, we held the line to ensure that we leave no family, no worker, and no community behind so that we could secure the strongest policies and investments for our most marginalized communities to deliver meaningful, tangible change to improve the conditions and to impact their daily lives. This week, the House has the opportunity and the obligation to legislate justice and begin rebuilding as a stronger, more just nation that takes care of its people. Not because it's good politics. I'll let the pundits speak to that. But because as lawmakers, we have a decisive mandate from the people to deliver policies and budgets that value their lives and the livelihoods of everyone in our communities. That means passing the president's full agenda, which is the people's agenda. I represent the Massachusetts Seventh, one of the most unequal districts in the country and in the Commonwealth. We're in a three mile radius, life expectancy drops from 92 years in Back Bay to 59 years in Roxbury, and median household income drops by $50,000. Where child care costs remain some of the highest in the entire nation, $21,000 a child for center-based care. Where the rising rates of asthma, extreme heat, and sea level rise disproportionately impact frontline environmental justice communities like Chinatown, East Boston, and Chelsea. The hurt and harm in my community runs deep and I see it every day. These inequities and disparities are not naturally occurring. They are the direct result of decades of precise and intentional policy violence and underinvestment that has been codified into our laws and our budgets for generations. So in this moment, as we do the work to build back better and to do so equitably, we must be just as precise and just as intentional in legislating and investing in justice and equity and healing. That's why we can't afford to leave any worker, any family, or any community behind. Madam Speaker, the Build Back Better Act is our chance to chart a new path forward and reverse the generations of policy violence inflicted on our most vulnerable. To finally make universal paid leave a reality for the millions of workers, disproportionately black and brown women who have been pushed out of the workforce, left to make the impossible choice between keeping food on the table or caring for themselves or a sick loved one. For the child care worker taking care of our babies but can't make enough to take care of their own. To finally invest in home and community-based services for the elderly and disabled as the critical infrastructure that it is. To finally make affordable child care and universal pre-K a reality. To combat climate change, to close the home ownership gap, to rebuild our crumbling housing stock, and finally honor our promises to our immigrant neighbors. These investments are possible. They are popular and they are necessary. We can wait no more. There is no deficit of resource in this country, only a deficit of empathy and political courage. We must pass the Build Better Act this week and make the long overdue investments that our workers, families, and communities have been denied for too long. Our nation is in crisis. The urgency could not be more clear. How we meet this moment will have lasting impacts and history will remember us for it. Thank you. Thank you, um, Representative Presley. 